Hi there, you're very welcome back to All In Business, your weekly business show here on Joe, backed by AIB. Today we're talking about the entrepreneurial mindset. Are entrepreneurs born or are they made? Here to discuss, we're joined by the man who drove storyful success and is now driving Kinzens. It's journalist turned tech entrepreneur, Mark Little. We're also joined by the woman who spotted a gap in the food waste market and leveraged it to help charities to feed those in need. It's Food Cloud founder, Isolt Ward. And Norman Crowley's Wicklow-based company, Cool Planet Group, just landed itself a cool 31 million euro in funding to further its mission to help improve energy efficiency. As Norman himself says, it's about making money, but it's also about stopping climate change. He's our trailblazer interview, so we'll be asking him about that and more in just a little bit. First though, as always, don't forget to hit subscribe to get the full show on YouTube and podcast. We're also on LinkedIn, on Facebook and on Twitter, where our hashtag is all in business. Joe presents All In, together with AIB, backing Irish business. Isolt and Mark, thanks so much for being with us. I'm going to jump straight into my first question about the entrepreneurial mindset, and it's a pretty basic one. Does such a thing exist, or is that just a made-up buzzword? I don't think it begins on day one. There's not such a thing you get gifted, like God on high sits down and says, there's your mindset. Like, I think it is fashioned out of like real struggle so I think you have to have be a certain type of person to take the risk in the first place there's that classic formulation of like if, if not me who if not when now so you have that sort of fierce urgency of now to quote sort of several politicians but as you go on the journey you get the shock of complete lack of recognition of this world you've stepped into this landscape and you just don't really have the skills mm -hmm. and at that point that's when the mindset starts to kick in that's when you start to learn lessons that countless entrepreneurs have learned before you. And that's when your brain starts to sort of subtly shift and change. Mm -hmm. And if you're lucky enough, you'll be mindful of that. And I think you'll start understanding that the most important thing here is resilience, mm -hmm. just to get through your days. But also as you get through each successive day, you start to be a little bit more relaxed, um, a little bit more aware that your central job, it's not survival or endurance, it's resilience. It's getting up every day knowing it's gonna be tough but you're going to work out the muscle memory to allow you to make better decisions without feeling like you're, you're about to die. Uh, Mark, you were well established in the workforce um, before you made the jump into being an entrepreneur and working for yourself. But Isolt, you started in third year of college, so yeah. you went straight into it. Do you think that made any difference? Did you have to adapt any faster, shall we say, or dig out some of that resilience Mark is talking about uh, at a much younger age? It was definitely a steep learning curve, having not had um, any point of reference of working previously, except in you know jobs that I had as a teenager or when I was a student. Um, but like I remember when we were hiring our first employees, thinking you know I besides working um, in a supermarket, I had very little experience of being managed, never mind being a manager. And, you know, when you're incredibly passionate about the problem that you're trying to solve and totally determined to, um, you know, develop a really effective solution, you see all of these um, new experiences and skills that you have to learn. And you often you see them before you are like after you need them. <laughs> um, and I think that's where the resilience really comes into it, because you kind of constantly feel like you're catching up. So I think coming um, straight from university definitely was uh, more challenging in terms of not um, necessarily having the skills, experience, often the confidence in those cases. Um, but then at the same time, the level of risk uh, on a personal level was lower because I was used to surviving off a very low income. Mm -hmm. I wasn't leaving anything behind. Coming out of university point, yeah. is a really great time to take a risk and you know, at the same, like all going wrong, you're leaving with an excellent education because, um, you know, entrepreneurism, I think whether it goes well or whether it doesn't, you are learning so quickly and you're learning skills that are incredibly transferable. So I think I had that in my mind as well um, on the tough days in particular to say like, you know, worst case, you've just um, really had an incredible experience and education in the last few years. Fortunately, it didn't come to that and I'm still learning and enjoying it. And before risk and resilience, success and failure, obviously has to come an idea. 
I'm sure lots of entrepreneurs or aspiring entrepreneurs have lots of ideas all the time, yourselves included. How do you know if you have your heart set on being an entrepreneur, which idea has legs, which one to, to back yourself mm. before you go looking for backing from anyone else? The one that you can't walk away from. <laughs> right. Yeah, like, you know, because you are going to come up against so many challenges, you have to almost blindly believe um, in the problem that you're solving, I'd say, is first and foremost, mm. because you may have to tweak the solution as you go. Um, but you'll know because you will, it will create the resilience that you need to get over all of the challenges that you'll face on the journey. Um, otherwise, it will be too difficult and you will give up. That's a great point. It, it doesn't start with the idea. It starts with the problem. Yeah. It starts with a human being, someone you can meet, and you know they've got a problem. Now, in many cases, because you're an entrepreneur, you may have lived that problem yourself, so you know it really intimately. And it's that problem rather than the solution. Yeah. Too many startups start with a whiteboard. Uh, and very few startups start with actually sitting down with somebody and watching and listening to them. And it's falling in love with that problem uh, rather than falling in love with your own idea of what the <laughs> solution should be, uh, I think is the key. And then the second thing, I suppose, then is, you know, people, when we say resilience, endurance, they always think you're playing word games with us. No, 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 there's a, there's a brain chemistry here. So endurance is survival. It's the back of your brain. It's your fight or flight mechanism. It's where all your bad decisions happen. And really the job is to lean forward into the front of your brain where the computer is sitting there to make rational decisions, and that's resilience. So, you know, fight or flight survival will lead you down the wrong path every time as an entrepreneur. It's only when you start leaning into the problem and start realizing, actually, this is, this is a kind of a puzzle that I've got to solve, yeah. and then you start making rational decisions. And that's where I think the entrepreneurial mindset really becomes so finely honed. Love your problem and make rational decisions, and don't think all about survival. You know, think about every day just failing that little bit, learning, Tweaking. next day fail a little bit again, learn from that, and just hopefully your momentum will be gradually uh, <laughs> up and up until you hit the hockey stick, hopefully. And you both talk about loving your problem, and obviously a lot of passion comes through for both of you. I know when we spoke earlier, you both mentioned that you thought that passion, not profit, should be what drives a company, especially at the start. But how realistic a goal do you think that is? Because obviously profit is the bottom line to, to stay alive. Well, for us, we're a non-profit and um, it doesn't mean that we don't make a profit or a surplus uh, financially. It just means that when we do, it goes back into the organisation mm -hmm. and is in reinvested. Um, and so actually, let me just then add on to my question, I suppose, for Mark more than yourself, Isolt. Do you think it's, uh, not to set you against each other, but <laughs> do you think it's easier to say passion, not profit, should drive a company when you're a not-profit rather than... No, because I'd say in a lot of cases we've had a more success financially than a lot of for profits, so I don't think they're comparable. <laughs> uh, it's been the start in the startup, um, you know, when you're a startup. Whereas I think we had, um, because we're set up as a social enterprise and a non profit, we have a very clear objective and we've always had it um, to be financially sustainable. So we've always looked for different funding sources um, from the partners that we provide a valuable service service to from um, supporters and sponsors like AIB actually are a huge support of, our, of ours um, and then also from grants etc. So you're looking for a diverse range of income streams and financial sustainability um, and to the extent that you know you can continue to deliver the impact that you're having and to grow the impact that you're having as well. So um, you're still very focused on that um, but you also know that the primary purpose is delivering impact and you can kind of frame your decisions in that way. Uh, it's the same with a profit-making business. Sometimes I think just non-profit is just a tax status, but the very common problems and common differences, um, are th the commonalities for me would be around this distinction between, first of all, price and lifetime value. This is a business concept all entrepreneurs learn, mm -hmm. and it's a really good one to think about your long-term impact. If all you care about is the price today of the capital you're raising or the company you might be selling, you're going to fail. If what you're thinking about is the old concept of lifetime value, I make an investment now that may not pay off for a while, but when I look back at my career as an entrepreneur, I see the lifetime value of my efforts. And I still see that in business I've set up in the past. People work in that business are now excelling. Yeah. And I think that's part of the lifetime value. I don't think an entrepreneur will die looking back and going, I wish I got another million on that exit. Yeah. They'll look back and go, look at the lifetime value that I had. 
Now, the second also distinction that both non-profit and profit-making businesses, I think, have is they understand it's not just about financial capital. It's about trust capital. And what I mean by that is you can raise a lot of money, but what, what's going to make you survive in the long term is when, as a founder, you have invested in people to build their trust. You're consistent with them. You're showing them that you trust them. You're giving them some power to do good things. And when things go to shit, you're going to cash in that check at some point and turn around to your people and say, listen, we've got to work together. It's a loyalty you check. You know exactly, but you have to invest in that, not just look at the idea of financial investment as the key to success. I think it's about this trust investment, particularly as a founder, mm -hmm. and that requires a greater degree of um, awareness, emotional intelligence, than simply doing a good pitch to a VC. Well, I'm glad you brought up uh, awareness and emotional intelligence, Mark, because one thing that I think is likely to happen here is that some people will be watching this maybe in a position like yourself in college with a burning idea they're wondering should they act on, or maybe like yourself, Mark, in a long established career and kind of itching to, to, to make a move into something else. And they may be asking themselves, do I have what it takes to be an entre entrepreneur? Do I have the entrepreneurial mindset? So what I would ask both of you is, what kind of questions should someone like that be asking themselves? How can they figure out and know if it's the right thing to do or if it's for them? I would just say, um, go for it and try it. Like, you know, if you want to test the water, go and speak to a lot of people about your idea. Um, I think there's kind of a, a lot of people think if you have an idea that you shouldn't tell anybody in case they go and do it. But like mm. the likelihood of finding somebody that is equally as passionate about your idea that they want to steal it and run off and do all of the hard slog and all of the errors and all of the need, all of the resilience to do it isn't that likely. Mm. Um, so I think actually trying to speak to people, definitely people that are close to you, getting good feedback from them um, is a good way to start. Um, but then I think to like find out whether you have it or don't, you really the best way to find out is just to go for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think about like four W's, you know. The first is like, um, what is the problem I'm solving here? Um, if you're just going into a business to get your desert island, like <laughs> it's just not the right thing to do. You know, there are easier ways to make a good living to be an entrepreneur. So what is the problem? Do I passionately believe in the problem? I think the second is like, why me? What have I got that's different? Why, why should I actually take on this, this problem and, and solve it? And why now? Is it the right time? Or maybe should I wait for a little bit to see how things develop, whether it's technology or the market? And the final is, what's the worst thing that can happen? The final W is that, right? If everything went to crap tomorrow morning and the thing failed, what would happen? Would I be okay with that? Am I okay with the worst thing? Because if you're okay with the worst thing can happen, then you've probably solved the biggest challenge that you have. Mm -hmm. You're not constantly fearing failure. You know it's okay. And I think one thing that as all said there was very important is no matter what, you'll be a better person. Because being an entrepreneur forces you to be way more emotionally intelligent, mm -hmm. uh, regulate yourself better, be aware of yourself better, understand how trust is built and lost. And as a result of all of that, unless you know, you've had a really particularly bad experience, I guarantee you'll come out a better person at the end of it. Okay, so huge personal impact. And it's interesting that you're both kind of involved. In, well, you're definitely involved in impact as a service, and you, you are as well, Mark. Um, in terms of the impact that you're going to have and the problems you're solving, tell us a little about that. And you know, you've both mentioned being passionate about the problem. Why were you so passionate about the particular problems that you are passionate about? Mm. Um, I was always uh, passionate about food personally and then um, finding out about food waste as a problem uh, it was really that moment of I can't like I can't not try and solve this um, and that was the feeling um, that uh, helped me and my co-founder start Food Cloud and um, really came from the fact that you know over 30 percent of food produced is wasted uh, resulting in about 8% of greenhouse gas emissions. If food waste was a country, it'd be the third largest emitter after um, China and the US. Okay. Um, and at the same time, we need uh, to produce 56% more food to feed populations by 2050. And we're facing into climate disaster if we don't actually find good solutions. Um, so all of those things <laughs> a few years a ago <laughs> kind of problem. made us look at and yeah. go, okay, well, our best effort is something here, um, mm. so let's go for it. Um, and then the other side of it is, of course, if you're rescuing good edible food and 
preventing all of the negative impact on the environment, that food is now ending up with people. And we are um, working with a network of over 650 um, charities in Ireland, um, another 7,000 in the UK, from homeless shelters to youth clubs to women's refuges um, to elderly centres. And all of that food, instead of creating a negative impact on the environment, is actually creating a really beautiful social impact. Um, so, you know, being able to take something that could potentially be so negative and create something so positive out of it um, is just something that's incredibly motivating. And in terms of the impact that food cloud is having, do you think the problem is on its way to being solved? Or uh, Unfortunately, food waste is a very big problem. So it'll take us a very long time, uh, especially if we're on our own. So we're hoping that we'll see an increased amount of solutions to food waste uh, coming out in the near future. There are many um, coming to the market at the moment. Um, but I suppose to date, we have um, redistributed the, about the equivalent of 80 million euro worth of food across the UK and Ireland. Um, but that's over the last few years and there's still an awful lot more to go. We've most of the major retailers working with us in Ireland, an increasing amount of the food companies coming on board. Um, but there's still more out there and we're still looking for more partners. And we still really need to focus on trying to rescue as much food uh, in Ireland as possible. Well, now you've officially put the call out. Yes. Hopefully they'll come <laughs> flooding in. And what about you, Mark? Yeah. Obviously, uh, you started in news and you stuck with news. Do you love news as much as ever? It's not just about news, it's about quality information. So like what Kinzen does is, you know, essentially we're trying to reconnect sources of quality information with citizens mm -hmm. and using technology to do that, uh, rather than what's happened is where technology has actually disrupted the way we get information. So we see a similar, like if you look at climate change, you look at mainly the political issues we have, it's all down to a pollution of the world's information supplies. We just get up in the morning and we're overloaded with information, so much of it is just wrong and toxic. And so what we wanted to do was realizing that fixing that problem is, is fixing the way we get information in our lives was, was one of the great challenges of our ages. And it's underpinning a lot of other related challenges. And so for myself and Anya, who's a co-founder of, of Kinzen, we've worked for technology firms, we work for big publishers, I've worked for the state broadcaster, I've been a startup person. We could think of no better way to have an impact to try to fix that problem. The second thing we realized was you can do you know, a very high impact or high visibility startup, but really the people who solve the world's problems are thinking about the infrastructure and the plumbing and the incentives. And so for us, it was really important to try and focus on the technology and not just create another website. Um, and so for that reason, we're working a lot of the underlying technologies on artificial intelligence to try rewire the internet so that people can get up and trust the information that they get from whatever the source appears to them. And that's one of the things we've been working on. And we've been stunned over the last two years of how many great people are thinking about the same problem. And I think it's similar at this moment when we have these existential challenges mm -hmm. that more and more in my lifetime, I'm seeing people devote themselves to the unsexy problems of fixing the plumbing, the infrastructure of our lives. Um, and, and rather than big showy, for-profit startups, uh, I think having some form of awareness of the impact you're having every day through your association with other people, and not always worrying too much about the visibility, but worrying about the problem you're solving again, as we've always said, and just knowing it may be a long haul. Mm -hmm. and, and that's it's not a three to five year window here. I'm hoping that this is what I do with the rest of my career. And as I say, I look back with the lifetime value being way in excess of whatever the prices were at any stage in that journey. That's, I suppose, what makes me feel good about knowing this is not going to be a three to five year rush at something. Mm. It's a long marathon with a lot of really good people around me. And I don't think you and Anya really have ever approached anything as a three to five year run, have you? Because you, both your companies now have been quite uh, adept at capturing the crest of a wave of the zeitgeist, by which I mean, you know, you, you cater to the Gen Z, you adapt with them. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on how culture and technology and entrepreneurialism are all kind of shaping each other at the moment. Yeah, I think there's a great generation shift. Like if you think back what people thought about great entrepreneurs, they were like charismatic individuals who'd get up on a stage and tell a great story and they were out there. They don't More want that anymore. Not anymore. Mm -hmm. Like now it's a generational shift where it's so important to be collaborative and a team builder and spend as much time on your own team as going out there to pitch the company. So maybe it's because like I'm an old Gen Xer like we were cynical, individualistic, and I'm finding this right like revival of my own sense of myself 
through being surrounded by people that are much more collaborative. And it's less about the charisma of the individual and more about your team building skills and mm. exercises. So like for me, this has been the big discovery of my later part of my career, mm. has been moving away from the, the notion of the entrepreneur as the crazy dreamer mm. to people, teams of collaboration. And that I think is a way more healthy uh, way to see the entrepreneurial mindset evolving mm -hmm. from back in the day when it was all about Steve Jobs or a crazy founder to now being really good team solving very important problems for the world. So that's possibly thanks to people like my daughter and Gen, mm -hmm. Gen Z. Uh, and, and that's a great thing. for It means I can focus on the things that are really important, um, less about what you appear to be to everybody outside your mm -hmm. company, which is a terribly draining way to live your life. And are there founders or CEOs out there like that at the moment that you would look to for inspiration? The ones that aren't all, you know, charisma and or, you know, yeah, the ones I'm, that I'm aren't Steve Jobs? I'm seeing people like Satya Nadella, who's the head of Microsoft, is a really interesting um, example of someone who's an outsider, you know. Um, and he came into this big company that was, you know, basically built on Bill Gates myth mythology. And now he has essentially wired trust into everything that Microsoft do uh, to the point of being carbon neutral as a goal for the company. And, and I know from dealing with that company, people inside it, that that has really percolated down the ranks of a major organization. So people like that are inspiring for me. Uh, and, and people like Isolt then on, on the other side who are building something from scratch, but doing it in a way that uh, doesn't sort of fit into some cookie cutter idea what an entrepreneur is. Um, and again, that's not just because it was here, but actually <laughs> there are other people like that as well who we admire. So people who are turning big super tankers around and looking more at trust and collaboration um, to people who are starting afresh with a really collaborative, impactful way of thinking about their, their, their careers. Um, both of those things at the moment, I think, are starting to move the needle when it comes to real change in our world. What do you think is all about, I suppose, everything Mark has said and the role of the founder, collaboration versus charisma? What have you found to be true in that regard? Yeah, I think uh, Mark's made a very good point there. Like, um, you know, you've got the stories like WeWork um, uh, recently, and I think that, you know, that's obviously a very extreme example, but that style of entrepreneurship and that crazy um, ruthless startup idea is... Um, I think is coming out of trend and out of popularity and it is more about looking at um, companies uh, um, and the journey of a startup as a marathon and not a sprint mm -hmm. and I think generally um, people as well are want more um, balanced lifestyles um, you know they want remote working is becoming something that um, is increasingly in demand and popular, flexible time. You see all of these things like people are no longer um, want this complete distinction between work and life and they're actually finding a way for the two to work together really well. And mm. I think um, for companies that can provide that flexibility, that balance uh, for their employees, they're the ones that are going to be around for a very long time. And I think those who um, oversee that and are just, um, or don't think in that way and are just completely determined on one goal, regardless of the people around them and not focused on building a team, um, don't have as great a chance of success. Just if I could add as well, one of the things about the last wave of the internet was move fast and break things, was the credo. Yeah. <laughs> now there's a, there's a new opportunity in, in moving with some purpose and building and fixing things. Mm -hmm. And so if anyone thinks that we're being airy-fairy and you know, being very sort of laid back and hippie about our approach to entrepreneurship, no, there's a fierce recognition that the world's problems and sustainability among them is the next, next great opportunity for entrepreneurs. So it's not just about being more uh, collaborative, it's actually about understanding that the way the internet is changing, particularly in technology, uh, the way sustainability is a major challenge, that this is where the venture capitalists are looking. Believe me, in Sand Hill Road in California and smart venture capitalists in Ireland and Europe, they are looking at things like sustainability as the next, next great opportunity for businesses. So it's not just about a change in mindset, it's also about a new purpose-driven business movement uh, that I think is going to be the dominant credo of the next 10, 20 years. Instead of the break things, it's fixing things. Mm -hmm. and, and that requires a bit of a shift as well in the way people think about entrepreneurship. And for that opportunity, 
obviously you need support, not just from the teams around you, but from things like governments as well. We've just had an election really quickly now because we're nearly out of time. I just want to ask you both, what's one thing you as an entrepreneur would call for from a new government for entrepreneurs? For us, the really the focus is on a green economy. And, um, you know, we've... It, we've until 2030, we believe, to see a really, really significant change in how our economy works, how we value things, and um, we need to see a dramatic shift in our in how we focus on climate change and how we manage sustainability and um, even in terms of policies, I suppose. Yeah, and thinking about it as um, more of an opportunity and an opportunity to create more value for our economy um, in a very sustainable way, rather than thinking of it as a cost and something that could lead to an increase in Great. increased prices, etc. I think it needs to be viewed as a positive. There's a lot of opportunity in it um, for individuals and for companies. And what about yourself, Mark? I would love to see a change in the way, uh, you know, what, what happens when a company sells the company. Uh, I would love to see a change in taxes, not to give a tax break, so I can keep more of my money. I would love to see a way that a successful entrepreneur can be incentivized to take the money they make from one exit and put it into something really impactful in the second. Like, you know, that would be for me a huge change if the government said, right, you'll get a tax break in any money you make as long as you reinvest it in something that's gonna have an impact here in Ireland. So working out a way to you know, change the way capital gains are done. Secondly, making it really, really simple to incentivize employees to have a share of the company. Uh, and obviously, potentially incentivize them to set up a company. Because remember, you know, I only ever expect people to be with a company three to five years. So creating entrepreneurs out of people who've worked in startups could be another way to change the so tax system. kind of system. sustainability. Two yeah. different kinds of sustainability yeah. you're both calling for, for I, similar things. I would love to see a bunch of entrepreneurs that continually build, you know, and, and not just sell, but, but see it for the long term. Or if you do sell, you know, get the money and reinvest it again uh, and, and work your taxation system around the idea of a continuous, permanent culture of innovation, not some race toward an exit. Uh, you're lionized, then you go off and do nothing. No, no. You got to have a way for the tax system to be rewarding people who take risks, but sharing that out across society, and not just to, to a bunch of very wealthy uh, people who've had a good success story. Okay, Mark and Itzel, thank you so much for that. And of course, you're not going to go anywhere. Stay with us because we'll be back to you for the one to watch in just a few minutes. The who or what in Irish business has caught your eye at the moment. Now, my next guest is about to explain why the secret to his success is the fact his business has three separate but equally important functions, impact, education and inspiration. Wicklow-based Cool Planet employs over 130 people and operates out of 26 different countries. Its CEO is energy expert Norman Crowley. Norman, this show being, or this episode at least, being all about the entrepreneurial mindset, tell me about your recent investment and how important was it to you to choose the right investor for you? Um, yeah, so we just raised 31 million um, from a French fund um, called TCO. Um, and it was important because when you're growing at the speed we're growing, you need to have some strong backing. And we've been bootstrapping the business for about 10 years and revenues this year are getting to the point where you just need a bit of strength behind you. So we've taken it as far as we can without somebody standing right behind us. In terms of how important the right partner is, for us, the business is all about climate change. Uh, climate change first, making money second. Um, and so it took a while to find a partner who match that basically so we had to do a lot of kissing of frogs yeah to find the prince yeah and is it more difficult when you have i guess your mar a company's morals as yeah. well as its mission yeah. to consider is it it's more, a lot difficult more difficult than, than we thought yeah yeah mm -hmm. yeah because not just it's not just the investor but advisors you're using people just aren't used to that being the thing you're trying to do um and I think advisors and banks all have a playbook, which is you, you know, you set up a business, you grow it, you sell it and you make money and you ride off into the sunset. Yeah. And tell uh, us more about Cool Planet. What do you guys actually do? So we break. So Cool Planet Group, which is the holding company of the whole thing, is broken up into three things. So we call it impact, educate, inspire. So impact is 
the businesses that make money, um, which mainly center around energy efficiency. So corporations waste fifty percent of all the energy they consume, and so we work with the biggest corporations Just in the 50%? world. Fifty percent. Yeah, yeah, oh my God. yeah. Which is kind of <laughs> crazy, really. Actually, in your house, you kind of waste probably thirty percent um, as well. Mm. So, but businesses are bigger, and it's harder to control waste, and so. So we stop that from happening. We have an Internet of Things software platform that does that. And also we do very, very big projects. And so that's impact. And that has a direct impact on carbon, on climate change. Now, to give you an idea on scale, every two weeks we would take out the same amount of energy as a power plant like Money Point in Ireland out, out of the world, just like that. Right. So and the reason we're operating at that scale is we're in 26 countries and we're dealing with people whose energy bills, like our biggest client's energy bill is 1.2 billion. So like they're spending a lot of dough. So you can save a lot of money if you're dealing with somebody of that scale. So that's impact. Mm. Um, and then when we started working on climate change, we realized that there was quite a major problem, which is that you have two types of people who are vocal about climate change. You have the climate deniers on one side, Trump, um, and that type of thing, who don't believe it exists. And in Ireland, we would have quite a small percentage of those people. But then we have a very vocal green lobby. And the problem with the green lobby, it's inherently a very good thing, but the problem is they tend to have a kind of quite a socialist element. And also their main message is, look, you just need to stop. You shouldn't strive to grow um, it's not a growth message, it's not a progressive message. And that's because 30, 40 years ago when climate change started, the only way to stop it from happening was to not travel in a car, not consume, right? Um, and so we felt that message now in 2020 was the incorrect message because, and what we say is life unlimited, right? So you can do all the things you always wanted to do. You can travel, you can have a nice car, you can eat something that tastes like meat. Um, and we felt that people weren't educated in the modern technologies that were available. Mm -hmm. So we started building our own education centers called Experiences. We built the first one in Dublin, um, out in Powers Court and Wicklow. Already 30,000 people have been through there, everything from schools to businesses. So that centerpiece of what we do, which is a not-for-profit, is to educate people about climate change. The final thing we do, which is radical and cool, is we felt that people had this message of lack of progress had been pushed for so long that we needed to shock people out of their way of thinking about what sustainability meant. So if I said to you, I have a new girlfriend, my wife, my wife might be shocked, but um, and you, you would say, what's she like? And I'd say, she's sustainable. Right. It's not something you go, wow, there's a romance that's going to last a long time. And even if I said to you, why don't you come to my house for a sustainable dinner party? You'd kind of go, it sounds kind of not great because so our minds are wired to think that sustainable means we've got to we're in for some pain here. So what Inspire that range of businesses does is it's designed to shock you. Um, and the first one of those we built is Electrify and Electrify takes very old, very beautiful cars, and it makes them into the fastest cars that have ever been built. And so it rechanges the wiring in your head mm -hmm. from, that's a very old car, it's a big gas guzzler, it must be slow, and then you see it go, and it, it is the fastest car in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and so that business, which everybody thought was just going to crash and burn, um, has become massively successful in only 12 months. Well, we'll come back to Electrify in a minute because mm. I think there's a lot to talk about there. But I want to steer you back for a moment to that client you mentioned mm. where uh, the overall number you'd be looking at is 1.2 billion. Yeah. Tell us a bit more about that because, I mean, there's operating at scale and then there's one client <laughs> worth yeah. 1.2 billion. Um, yeah, well, their, their energy bill is 1.2 billion. They're, they're how much that, what, what would be saved through working with um, you? Over a five year period, we'd mm. save them about four to 500 million um, wow. a year. So okay. every year, yeah. Um, so, um, and that's the scale we're operating at now. So we would work with big food companies. So four of the top eight food companies in the world, seven of the top eight pharmaceutical companies in the world, 
a lot of big mining companies, a lot of big oil companies as well. So, and we're not, some people would say, well, you're a very green company. You shouldn't be working with oil companies, but oil companies are big polluters, right? So mm. if we can fix that, why wouldn't we talk to them? And if we can, like the biggest client that we've just started working with, um, they have one site where the energy bill is 700 million. Just one site, not every You must every hear site. those numbers and just do cartwheels when well, yeah. clients come to you. Once we can get in the door, then we're happy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And Norman, you're in 26 different countries at the moment. Mm. Um, obviously, one was, uh, was and is the UK. Yeah. Tell me what had to change for you guys post-Brexit. Well, it, the problem with Irish companies in general is it's great and it's terrible is that we live next to a market, the UK, that's 17 to 20 times bigger than we are, has the same laws, give or take, and they speak the same language. And it gives Irish companies a very bad habit because we can nip over there in 45 minutes. And, and it's kind of the same as here. And a lot of them came from here. And we were like that in 2016. So 70% of our whole business was in the UK and we were growing very fast in the UK. And Brexit kind of shocked us, the idea that this could all go, basically. And so we went into a dramatic program where we stopped investing in the UK almost completely. And we started to figure out what it was like to do business in weird places like Sao Paulo and mm. Louisiana. Yeah. And so now the UK is only about 3% of our total business. And... There isn't really a plan to expand away from that. Um, but that was, you know, our business is speaking nine different languages. So it was a very dramatic change. And we made that change from late 2016 till 2019, you know. So I wouldn't underestimate how easy that is. It's quite difficult. But the result of it is profound. Like we're completely insulated from any effect of Brexit, you know. Um, well, you read the rewards, obviously. You do, but it's not long-term. for the faint of heart. It's very, and I noticed that Irish businesses are not making the move because, you know, when you talk, I'm in the UK like every three weeks and like they don't believe anything bad is going to happen out of this. They, in fact, most people now think it's all over, right? Mm. Where in actual fact, the pain is only just beginning. Yeah. They might not like to hear that, but... but it's true. You, yeah. 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 Um, and in terms of adapt or die as a business strategy uh, in the midst of Brexit, et cetera. I mean, I would think that is a sign of an entrepreneurial mindset. Yeah. But the entrepreneurial mindset started a lot earlier for you. I believe you had, what, five people working <laughs> for you by the leaving cert? Is that yeah, right? Yeah, I had five people work for you when I was 15. Yeah. So. Um, and this was down in West in Cork? West Cork, in Clannacilty, yeah. So I grew up on a farm just outside of Clannacilty. And, um, and I grew up in a, in a different generation to you where... Like it was a very, it wasn't liberal at all. It was very much a kind of closed mindset, kind of Catholic. Um, and also there was no money. And mm. so the only thing you could do, well, you could live in that lifestyle or you could decide to get out. And I wanted to get out. And when we were kids, a bit like now, you would watch television and, you know, we would watch Dallas where they had an aspirational lifestyle and we you know, at a very young age, I aspired to that. And also at a very young age, I was obsessed with engineering. So I used to write code when I was 12. And then my dad taught me how to weld when I was 12. Like health and safety wasn't a very strong <laughs> guiding light back then it is now. And um, so then I used to do work for local farmers and build sheds and stuff like that. And that just built and built. Yeah. So very different to now where you would finish your leaving cert and then go to university. Like the day I finished my leaving cert, I was 16 and I just went back to work. And at that stage, we had seven jobs on and they all needed to get finished. So, yeah, it kind of went from there, basically. Yeah. And uh, how important do you think heroes were to you from the time you were down in West Cork up until the present day? Because obviously Inspire is a part of your mission. Yeah. Who's inspired you along the way? Um, it's various people. Richard Branson back then, who's now become a friend. Um, you know, people in the early days was just successful business people. Mm. that were a lot of more fictional. You know, even now I watch Billions, which is a fictional concept, and um, and now it would very much be the likes of Elon Musk, not because of the riches, but because of the courage, like. 
the hardest thing in the entrepreneurial mindset is is you get the shit kicked out of you 10 times a day, right? And therefore, it is getting up after that. And so, yeah, you can see us with our fancy businesses and our fancy houses and cars, but actually every single person who's operating in that environment is putting up with challenges all the time. Like, I leave here, I'll check my email, and there'll be seven problems that, and one of them will appear insurmountable for a couple of hours, you know, and... That is the reality of this. And the reason I do a lot of talks on this and the reason people ask me to do them is because I explain what it's actually like rather than that aspirational thing. Yeah. Warts and all. Well, it is about the warts. Like the, there's two things about the good times, right? The good times are great, but they're very short lived. Like, you know, we raised all that money. We celebrated for an hour. Um, and then we went back to work, right? Because it's about the work and it's about solving the problem. That's what's happening 23 out of the 24 hours of the day. Yeah. And Elon Musk is a personal hero. No coincidence then that his engines are inside electrify yeah. cars. Yeah, yeah. Tell us more about electrify because I hear that yeah. one of the cars you're working on is going to end up being worth three million for one car. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And there'll be a couple of those <laughs> in the 2020 year. Yeah, so we take, we do two things. We take very old cars and we convert them to what we call hyper classics. So very fast classic cars. And they're extremely desirable. And that's witnessed by, uh, there's quite a lot of celebrities have ordered the cars, like Dev Patel has ordered a car. Ellie Goulding's wedding car, we built for her wedding. Um, so... Um, and there's some other stars that we're not allowed to talk about who are incredibly large global names. And I'd imagine you're not churning these out no. well, by if, the week. Yeah, if you're going to build cars in Ireland, then you can't, like we get criticised a bit for why don't we build like a, a 20,000 euro electric car, but the Irish cost base um, is not built around building like cars like Hyundai can build cars. So you have to build, if you're in the Irish market doing cars, you have to build exclusive cars that cost quite a lot of money. And so that's what we build. And so like we build little cheap cars, like we build baby Fiat 500s um, from the kind of 80s and they're very cute. Um, and they might be 20,000, 30,000. But in general, the things we're building are extremely expensive. And then the other things we, we do is we build cars under license from companies like AC, very old brand cars, um, but they're brand new and they are extraordinarily special. Yeah. Mm, this sounds like one to watch for the future. Absolutely. Yeah, but the mission on that is not to be Elon Musk. It's not mm. to build, like our aspiration is to build 50 cars a year, but to build 50 of the most extraordinary cars you've Luxury. ever seen. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, from cars to cabinet, there's a new government. Yeah. Or a new government being formed. Yeah. What do you think entrepreneurs need from the new government? Or as an entrepreneur yourself, what yeah. would you be looking for and pushing for? Well, what we need, we're not going to get from any of the people who get elected. So, like, we, you know, you need to incentivize entrepreneurs more. The government isn't prepared to do that. Um, we, From a green point of view, we need some fairly radical strategies. The government's not prepared to do that. So be it Sinn Féin, Fianna Fáil, Fianna Gael, we're not going to get what we want. And so we we watch um, it with amusement from the side. And then, like, our job is to actually hire the people that get hired here and pay their wages, right? Mm -hmm. They're, the only thing we hope from a government is they don't rock the boat too much in that regard, right? Because we're trying to do business here, yeah. So it's we watch and, and hope they don't mess it up. But right. we're not looking for anything from them because they don't really give us. There are certain government agencies that we admire, the EPA, the, the Environmental Protection Agency, Enterprise Ireland, who have great leadership and do a super job for us, um, for startups in Ireland. But the government itself, just please don't do anything to mess this up. The boom that's that we the headline right there, yeah, I think. Please yeah, like don't the do boom anything that we the boom that exists in Ireland does not come from government. It comes from and this is a this is a financial statistic, right? Is it comes from the indigenous Irish companies and it comes from the multinationals. So just 
let us get on with it. Yeah. Okay, Norman, that's where we'll leave it. Thanks so Thank much you. for being with us. Thank you. I'm still here with Isold Ward of Food Cloud and Mark Little of Kinzen, who are about to tell me they're one to watch who or what they've got their eye on in Irish business at the moment. So I'll start with you, Isold. What has caught your eye and why? I've really been watching the kind of plant-based diet trend. I think as people become more aware and conscious um, of their own environmental footprint and also uh, the environmental impact that food and our food system has, um, people are looking for um, small changes they can make in their day-to-day -day lives to have a positive impact. And I think switching to a more plant-based diet is um, one of those changes. Um, it was shown recently that uh, switching to a two-thirds vegan diet um, can reduce your food footprint by about 60%. Um, so this idea of flexitarians and people who, um, you know, will eat meat sometimes, but will try and um, switch to vegan or vegetarian diet as much as possible is something that we're going to see a lot more of. And is this something you're following as a spectator or as a participant? Um, both. Um, watching with great interest, especially seeing the trends and different foods that are coming up in our supermarkets. Um, and then also trying to do my best um, as well. Very good. What about yourself, Mark? So I'm looking at the, the rise of the creator economy. So, you know, all of us are obsessed with these big media companies like Netflix and Apple and Disney. I'm actually looking at the exact opposite. I'm looking at people who are basically starting off with a community of people they want to talk to uh, and creating small businesses. And so as a consequence of that, we're seeing the rise of these incredible platforms like Patreon as an example, whereby you know, people have a podcast or a newsletter and they talk to a community uh, and they can connect with them and they can generate their first thousand fans and they can make mm -hmm. a business out of that. So I think the rise of things like Stripe which obviously has an Irish mm -hmm. connection, in allowing people to you know, create memberships, uh, communities, uh, that's what I'm seeing more of. So in Ireland, for example, you see people like Second Captains in Sport or Blind Boy uh, with his podcast on these platforms like Patreon. So for me, the future is not the rise of big new media companies, it's the rise of countless small, tiny media companies built around people that have a direct connection to a small community. That's the future. And I'm not just looking at it as an observer. I think also I look at the rise of quality information sources among that countless universe of people as well. So that's what I'm looking at at the moment. OK, two really interesting things to keep our mm -hmm. eye on there for the coming weeks. Mark and Isolde, thanks so much for being with us. Well, that's it for this week. Thanks so much to my guests, Mark Isolt and Norman, for being here. Thanks to you for watching. And of course, thanks to AIB for backing the show. Don't forget to hit subscribe to get the full show each week. And next week, we'll be talking about the investor mindset with Acts, John O'Sullivan, all in regular Brian Caulfield and Claire McHugh from Axonista. So you don't want to miss that. See you then. <laughs>